So it is fitting that each week we observe the Lord's Supper. It is an ordinance, ordinance that we observe continually throughout our Christian walk. It is a sign of ongoing fellowship with Christ, and we want to remember what he did for us. So our passage this morning is 1 John 1, verses 1 and 2. If you don't have a Bible, there are some men coming uh, up front, and as they come down the aisle, hold up your hand, and they'll put a Bible in your hand. If you don't own a Bible, you may take this one with you as a gift from Grace Bible Church. So let's pray. Father, thank you for inviting us to your table. We come with joy and thanksgiving and a deep love for Christ. It is by your grace that we have the assurance of your love for us. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do for your children. In Jesus' name. So let's read together 1 John 1, 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. John is writing the book of 1 John to address the heresy being spread uh, in the church by false teachers. One of the most prevalent heresies was the denial of the incarnation, that Christ had not come in the flesh. One of John's methods of exposing false teaching was to have believers recall the fundamentals of their faith. John expresses the certainties of Christianity in very simple and clear terms. His objective was to leave no doubt in the minds of believers as to the fundamental nature of their salvation. So let's take a look at some of the gospel basics written in these two passages. Verse 1, my little children. First of all, you can hear the voice of a true shepherd. John has a direct, affectionate message for his people. He says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Immediately, John is laying out for his readers that his primary purpose in writing was to instruct and warn readers against sinning especially in the same manner as the heretics. We might be tempted to read this passage and think, we are to be sinless, except for what comes next in verse 1. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is a principal statement in God's redemptive plan. Here is the key to the doctrine of salvation. If we sin, and we will, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Belief in Jesus' death and resurrection as a payment for sins for all who were given the faith to believe is a doctrinal pillar of this epistle. So let's look again at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So let's talk about the word if in the phrase, and if anyone sins. The word if communicates that this is a conditional statement. But according to the Greek definition, it means that it will happen. Not if it will happen. It will happen. Please note the pronoun we in this passage, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The we refers back to the little children, and believers are the little children. It is we who have the advocate. 
So what does it mean to have an advocate? Everything. The Greek word for advocate is parakletos, which means intercessor, consoler, and comforter. Parakletos is translated in the NIV as one who speaks on our defense, like a defense attorney. Since we have an advocate who is like our defense attorney, how will this look in the time of our judgment? God knows the record of our sin. Our advocate, Jesus Christ, knows our record, and we know we're guilty. So God has every right to punish us with death. One author says this about our defense attorney. He says, we couldn't have a better defense attorney. He's never lost a case. Not only that, the judge is his father, and they know each other perfectly. Not only that, the judge is our father, and he is sympathetic to his children. Our attorney knows our weaknesses because he became one of us. God appointed our defender. God chose a court-appointed court public defender for us. He chose the best one in the universe, the only one that could ses successfully argue our case. Let's go on to verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but, for also, but also for those in the whole world. We see that Jesus Christ is not just an advocate, but also the pr propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means appeasement or satisfaction. God chose his son to be a propitiation for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took the punishment for every sin, past, present, and future, for all those who would believe in his death and resurrection and would put their trust in him as their savior. He bore the punishment in our place. No one can bring a successful accusation against us because God has already declared us just. Romans 8.1, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One author says this, it was not the propitiation of a loving Christ that won the love of God, just the opposite. It was the love of God that sent Christ to be the propitiation. Yes, God is just. Yes, God is holy. But he is also loving. And out of that comes his grace and mercy and forgiveness. What was his motive? Love. Self-sacrificing desire for our well-being, even though we are utterly unworthy and undeserving. So now let's go to the last part of verse 2. Not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. This is not a statement of universalism. Jesus did not pay for the sins of all humanity. But he did pay for the sins of all those who have placed their faith and trust in him, in Israel, and in the whole world. If you have just heard this message and do not acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, we're glad that you're here, and we would love to talk to you about what it would mean for you to have Christ as your advocate. Also, you must know that the Lord's table is not for you. It is for those who are members of the family of God. So please allow the elements to pass you by. And I just want to add this. As parents of younger children at Grace Bible Church, we appreciate that you are instructing your children in the ordinance of communion. The elders have left to the discretion of the parents the timing of children's participation in communion. 
please remember that the primary requirement for participation in communion is that your child has received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Even though a child may profess salvation, the decision to take communion should not be rushed into. A genuine faith often requires time and testing to reveal itself. As a child matures in his faith, it is evident that he is truly born again. The parents will be able to determine as to when he is ready to fully understand and participate in communion. So please remember, taking communion as an unbeliever may place that person in the danger of God's judgment. If you are a parent that would like help walking through these decisions, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of the elders. If you are a child and you are trusting fully in the death of Christ to pay for your sins, and if your parents are not ready for you to participate in communion, here is what you can do during this time. Continue to walk in your faith. Be obedient to God's word and be in, sub in submission to the authority of your parents. Men, please come and serve us. You may take communion on your own today. When you, uh, you may take it on your own when you're ready. Please use this time to examine yourself, to acknowledge your, any unconfessed sin, and to rejoice in your relationship with your Savior.